All right. Good evening once again, everyone. Um, welcome to the Memphis Horticultural Society's August meeting. And uh, this is our first meeting in a couple months. We're really glad to get back on charge with that. And uh, <laughs> people are still joining us. So our speaker tonight is Patrick Thompson. And he is the, <laughs> he's the curator uh, of the Donnelly Davis Arboretum at Auburn University. Uh, the Arboretum specializes in plants native to the region, including the Auburn azaleas, which are a collection of native deciduous azalea cultivars developed at the Arboretum. I know that those types of plants are very near and dear to all of our hearts. Another of the Arboretum's core collections are Saracenias, or pitcher plants, which are also native to Alabama and will be the focus of our talk this evening. Meanwhile, Patrick is another Alabama native for us, and he holds a Master's of Science in Horticulture, which was awarded at Auburn. And I asked him just to give me a little bit of information about himself, and he gave me this rundown. He said he shares his home with, are you ready? One wife, three children, three dogs, three cats, 15 koi, six turkeys, 12 chickens, one python, two rats, a few dozen aquarium fish, and what he describes as a ridiculous amount of plants. He also said he has some hobbies, including woodworking and sausage making, but I'm not sure how he can have any hobbies once he's done taking care of all those animals and plants. So we'll have to get into that in another session, perhaps. Uh, he just got back from a few days on a camping trip looking for sandstone oaks, which is a very rare species native to Alabama. Hopefully we'll have time sometime this evening for you can tell us a little bit about the sandstone oak and also the rest of his trip and maybe a little bit about those animals. So please join me in welcoming Patrick Thompson, and I am about to make him the host. All right, thanks, Stephen. Well, fortunately, the uh, wife and children all participate in the taking care of the animals around the house. Not so much in the woodworking, but sausage making is an all hands on deck experience. So, uh, it takes a team for all of these things that I'll be talking about tonight, actually. And so, Let's see if I've got the ability to share my screen. So you guys don't have to look at me anymore because I've pulled together quite a few pictures that I hope you enjoy. And Patrick, remember you have the ability to mute people. All right. I'll, I'll do what I can with it. But if everybody will just stay muted and be okay, because I think I'll have to do some some scrolling to find out to find people to mute. But I won't be I won't be too shy with it. So I decided to get right into this talk with a really clunky, complex title slide. So. The, the tall trappers in Alabama's beakrush bogs. All of that should confuse you at least a little bit. And so it's totally intentional. Now, pitcher plant bogs are what most people call these places where these pitcher plants live. But pitcher plants aren't the only thing in there. And it is what we're going to focus on. But I just wanted to get this slide up front for starters so we could acknowledge that. You know, there's a lot of other things going on in these bogs. They're really complex. A lot of things live in there that are very well adapted, and they all work together in some really amazing ways. And I wish I had time to really get into all of the complexity of those interactions tonight. But the pitcher plants themselves are so interesting. We will jump right to that focus in a second. But George Folkerts is a legendary professor from Auburn University that did a lot with pitcher plants and inspired me to get into plants from the beginning when I was a zoology student. But he thought the pitcher plant bogs should be called beakrush bogs because the diversity of sedges in there blow away the pitcher plant diversity by a mile. There's 60 species of Rhynchospora, just one genus of sedges in here. You can see in that upper right photo with the Saracenia flava, the yellow trumpet pitcher plant there, those white top sedges and everything along the bottom row are types of sedges. So in Alabama, we've got 60 species of Rhynchospora and just seven species of these Saracenia. So 
you need to give a little nod to the other species that are in there too. And the pitcher plants do trap things. They are carnivorous, but there's also sundews, bladderworts, and butterworts, and other shorter statured carnivorous species in the fogs too. But these tall pitcher plants are really eye catching and really amazing and really have an entire ecosystem built around them. And in those two white top pitcher plants in the photo there, you see a frog peeking out of one of them. And they have figured out that the bugs do come to these pitcher plants and the nectar attracts insects to them. And so we do have predators that hang out in those pitcher plants. But then there's other things like that Zyra moth just to the right of it that is not going to get eaten by the pitcher plant, but it will in fact lay its eggs in the tube and its caterpillars will develop inside the pitcher. So a lot of complex relationships going on here. And we will talk about you know, quite, a, quite a few aspects of this, including conservation. And so if we were to lose a species of pitcher plants, it wouldn't just be losing that one species. It would be all the things that work with it. But first, I want to give you guys a little bit of background on the Arboretum and Alabama's biodiversity and how I got into pitcher plants. So let's just dive right into all of that. The Donald E. Davis Arboretum is at Auburn University. We're on the main campus next to the President's House on College Street. And uh, we have a very strong horticulture department and forestry department at Auburn. But that's not what the Arboretum is directly associated with. We're actually in the Department of Biological Sciences with the Herbarium and the Natural History Museum. And so we're very glad that we have plenty of scientists backing up our activities. And that's how we get away with hitting so hard for being such a small garden. We only have three full-time staff, but we do, we do quite a bit. So there's a little bit of lag in the slide change. I'll get used to that. Okay. I hope so. All right, so the Arboretum is 14 acres, and it just happens to be shaped very similarly to the shape of the state of Alabama and we've laid out our plant collections accordingly. So in the southwest corner of the Arboretum, we have sand dunes and coastal displays. And as you travel north through the Arboretum, it would be like traveling north through the state of Alabama. So you get to the north end of the Arboretum where you could be up in the Highland Rim or the Cumberland Plateau and you'd be seeing hemlocks and big leaf magnolias and rhododendrons with large evergreen leaves. So it's an interesting trip, but we are based on Alabama's uh, flora and being an arboretum, trees were our first major collection project. So if you look at this heat map from Bonap, you can see where the concentration in the U.S. is of large tree species. And you guys are doing pretty good over there in Memphis, but it really does zero in right there on Alabama. So we have tons of large tree species that would make a fine collection, but we branched out from that a little bit. So you can see here, just some quick by the numbers look at the Arboretum. And uh, one thing that we do have are a couple of nationally accredited plant collections. And so our Quercus collection includes 39 species of Alabama native oaks. And our rhododendron collection, mostly deciduous azaleas, is also accredited. But the one that we're working on now is Saracenia. And from our first mentoring till full accreditation on the Quercus was a seven year process. So it is intense work to get these collections accredited. And uh, Stephen mentioned that Alabama sandstone oak, and that's the central picture right there. It's kind of a three lobed dwarf species that lives right out on sandstone outcrops in the, in the hot, hot sun. And as soon as you get off of those outcrops and glades, yeah, it's yeah. competed by the white oaks and the post oaks and the sand oaks that live around. All right. So oaks 
really do find the center of their diversity for the U.S. and Alabama, and right in southwest Alabama. 28 species occur in a few counties right there together. And you guys might know that some of our native species can be a little promiscuous. Oaks are one of those. They hybridize freely between the two main subgenera, the red oaks and the white oaks. And so we try to help interpret that for people, but as you can see, there is quite a few things to interpret. So this is assignment that we have in the arboretum with our oak collection. And these are just the white oaks in Alabama. So that's less than half of the oak species. But part of the uh, challenge, being a native plant collection, is getting people to realize that being an oak tree is nice, but if you can appreciate the diversity within the genus, then that's a whole other level of understanding. And we're going to try to accomplish something like that with the pitcher plants tonight. And like I said, I'll get I'll get used to this lag and the screen change. There we go. And so our work with pitcher plants is right now really well accomplished in just the visual displays. You can come enjoy pitcher plants, but we're trying to, before we can get that accreditation, really take our collections curation to the next level, and that requires some major strategic planning and with the pitcher plants, that's an evolving thing, but I'd just like to give you a little peek into a benchmarking study that we did with these deciduous azaleas before we got our accreditation for that. It involved sending out a survey to all of the public gardens that the Association of the Public Gardens of America pointed out to us with significant deciduous azalea collections. And so, with these plant collections that are going to have conservation value and aesthetic value, it's really important to have documented wild source information for these species. And so to have an Alabama azalea is nice, but to actually conserve the genetics for the species, you need to have a diverse collection, you need to know where they're from, you need to have a plan to keep those alive. And so you can see the AU Davis Arboretum is that big gray wedge to the right, has 14% of the wild documented deciduous azaleas reported for the survey. And the uh, major competition over there, or how about teammates? Our major teammate in conserving deciduous azaleas is the Mount Cuba Center up in Delaware. So they have 75 full-time employees keeping that collection going. But there's some famous gardens that you don't see on here real close to us, like Callaway Gardens, and in Mobile, there's uh, the Mobile Botanic Gardens, for one thing, but uh, they don't keep the level of records needed to provide a response even to a survey like this. And so it's that intense record keeping and documentation and frequent field checks of existing collections that are required to get that accreditation. And so, again, the last page that I'll show you out of this benchmarking study shows that Alabama azalea where those wild specimens break out. And you can see that the Davis Arboretum has 75 of 165 of those living specimens. And of all the 291 living specimens of Alabama azalea, most of them are wild collected. And so a lot of the species, that's not the case, but this is, this is good for the Alabama azalea. If something were to happen in the wild, we would have backup material that we could repopulate areas with. And as more and more of the landscape gets developed, the yeah. need for things to repopulate the built world grows. And man, the Alabama daily is a good looking plant. I mean, if we can't get people behind getting this in the landscape, then we've got some major challenges. But one good thing about having 40 different counties worth of Alabama daily in the collection, it gives you a chance to really see the diversity within the species. And so there's you know, an impressive amount of diversity just in that little handful. And that was just me walking through the garden, plucking a flower off of each plant you know, of what was in bloom on a given day. And you get that typical yellow blotch, white flower, sometimes almost no blotch, sometimes a little bit of a pointy thing going on. But then when you go out in the wild, these are mostly 
you know, single representatives from the five. But this is in Southwest Alabama. All of these photos are from a single site, a single population on a single day. And on one hillside, we've got plants that have solid white flowers, some with a pinkish tinge, some with a dissected kind of spider type effect to the corolla. We've got parts of the uh, petals, or parts of the uh, anthers becoming petaloid, giving you that double effect, yellow plant. And also the standard Alabama azalea in the upper left there was the most common one on the hillside. But you can also get some really fine ball trusses out of some of these too, like that photo. So just running past some of our other collections as we get to the pitcher plants. So we really hadn't gotten into rare plants yet until the public gardens really started trying to take on that in the early 2000s and it was suggested to us by the georgia plant conservation alliance that we should take on pitcher plants you know alabama is the capital of them also in the southeast and in 2010 we started the alabama plant conservation alliance about the same time we got into pitcher plants and the uh, plant conservation alliances are sprouting up all over the place and uh, tennessee there it's at austin p university the southern grasslands initiative a uh, young man named Cooper Breeden is the coordinator for the Tennessee Plant Conservation Alliance. And he's been in this position for over a year now and has got quite a few balls rolling. It's a, it's a great program they've got going there, Austin B. But with so much pitcher plant diversity in Alabama, it was just really was something that we, you know, could not refuse the suggestion. So you see, there's another heat map like those Bonap diverse, Bonap maps showing where the species overlap and so up there in the northeast corner of alabama there's a single species it is a federally endangered species me and steve were talking about pitcher plants at little river canyon just before the meeting started and so that lives there and then in the central part of the state you can see the alabama pitcher plant or canebrake pitcher plant there but on the coast is really where these things become diverse and overlap and so we'll see some more about them those coastal bogs as we go but this is background getting to the basics so the trap of the plant is a leaf a highly modified leaf that's rolled together to create a hood and this pitcher that has an attractive zone conductive zone and the detentive zone at the bottom is where the uh, the necromath builds up with lots of little bugs that this thing can digest and so the uh, leaf is very important for most of these southern plants just as a trap, but in the northern group that we saw in the northeast corner of the state, they actually have a lot of phyllodia that is just a leaf that doesn't create a trap. Pretty unique from the picture plant. Right. There we go. So now we can see a cross section of the leaf of the purple pitcher plant. And these plants are carnivorous, so they can have a leg up on other species at places where there's not enough food in the soil. And they're using the nitrogen, potassium, and phosphorus from this prey to do photosynthesis. So they still have green leaves. They're still doing the same thing other plants do, but if there's not enough MPK in the ground for them to build the parts of themselves they need, then they get a leg up by snatching those things as they fly by. And the other main part of a pitcher plant is, of course, the flowers, which is just a mechanism to grow seeds to spread themselves around. And so that picture in the upper left, you can see a white top pitcher plant leaf facing away in the flower here with the petals reaching out away from that staminal tube and the uh, reproductive bits there, the anthers and the filaments are exposed when you pull out that petal. And then the stamen is actually that huge recurved flat surface. And 
right at the base of that, it'll swell into the seed pod you see in the bottom picture with all those beautiful little pitcher plant babies. Well, seeds that'll turn into babies. There we go. All right, and so the root structure for our pitcher plants is going to be a perennial rhizome, and it is well adapted to fire. It sits usually just on the soil surface, and those roots do water uptake, and they hold it in place. Keep that plant from falling over. And uh, we won't have too much time to talk about propagation, but dormant season rise up provisions are a good way to propagate pitcher plants. So you can see a crowded container there can get cut up into several little rise up sections. As long as you hold that growth point on the left intact, then they'll just keep on pushing forward. Into the ground. So, there are some other types of pitcher plants around. The Darling Tony is a cobra lily from California. And then the sun pitchers, the Heliamphora in South America, are both in the family Theracinaceae. And then in Southeast Asia, you've got the Cephalotus and the Penthes. And they are cute, wonderful things that have developed all of the benefits of a pitcher in a totally different lineage. And so it's happened multiple times. So that's the background. You guys are now ready for some detailed conversation on pitcher plants, I think. So do we have any questions yet? And remember, you can be typing your questions using the chat feature throughout this presentation. And whenever we pause, we'll catch up. All right, thanks, Steve. And I've got plenty to keep rolling with. So I'm just going to keep on rolling. And we're going to get into some wild pitcher plants. We're going to look at the habitat and talk about the different types of pitcher plants that grow here in South Asia. Okay. So there is a huge diversity of wetlands and a huge amount of wetland diversity in there. And uh, there's just so many different things to be seen out there. The photo on the bottom left there is, uh, we call it the big bag, big bag, we call it the big bog in uh, Baldwin County, Alabama. It's part of the Splinter Hill Bog Complex, which is the largest remaining carnivorous plant community in the world. And it covers hundreds and hundreds of acres. There's a lot of bogs scattered throughout it. Uh, there's a very publicly accessible nature conservancy property with a nice parking area where you can go see really well-maintained white top pitcher plants and a few other species growing there together in South Alabama. And this uh, spectrum that these bogs occur in is really amazing. On the left there, we have the Alabama canebrake pitcher plant, which grows in gravelly hillside seeps. And it is a gravel, gravel hillside. I mean, rocks with water in between them is what these things are growing in. There's a little bit of organic matter at the top, but once the organic layer builds up to a certain level, then the competition starts coming in. And that's the benefit of having fire in the habitat is to limit that competition by things like the tulip poplar you can see coming up behind Jenny Day. Nothing we want to get your plant box. And then all the way to the other end of the spectrum, we can see Debbie Folkert's there taking pictures of the hooded pitcher plant on a canoe trail in Okefenokee Swamp. And that is growing in standing water. There's water behind it. It's not rooted into the land. That thing has its roots spread out in the water, basically as a floating entity. And so it's really impressive the diversity of habitat these things survive. Most of them are going to have fire. It's hard to get fire right out on the water, but on the gravel and in the peat bog in South Alabama, you definitely do get fire running through there. And so you can see the uh, longleaf pine there in the upper photo. And it has been struck by lightning. You can see the fresh burn tissue down at the bottom. So that hat and the Alabama pitcher plant bog, that there's any albumensis. And then the photo below it, you can see those rhizomes right on the top of the soil, just, you know, pretty well charred. And then all of these new pitchers and leaves coming up from the fire. 
so there's three main groups and, and of bogs in Alabama. The mountain bogs up in the northeast part of the state. The fall line bogs are on those gravelly slopes around Montgomery. And then the coastal bogs with the most diverse groups of species. And so we're going to get to see some range maps here and see where these things are growing. So there's any later, the winged pitcher plant goes west all the way to Texas for the westernmost reach of the range for the genus. And again, also occurring in Alabama, of course. And here's a photo from my student, Noah Young, where you can try to wrap your brain around the diversity here within a single species. I mean, from clear yellow to dark, dark purple, and literally everything in between. And so the just, I'm speechless every time I get out in the field with these things and see the range of colors that they can produce. Now, the white top pitcher plant might be the most beautiful native plant in the world. There's, there's a few things that could give it competition, but that, uh, you know, veined white tube, and these things are in competition with Saracenia flavor for being the tallest of the pitcher plants. They can get over 36 inches tall. Really, really amazing to see out in the field. And they can be almost white, even whiter than this, or really, really dark purple. And so it's, it's wonderful to find them in the field. So I've seen a flavor, the yellow pitcher plant runs up the east coast, as you can see, but also keeps its feet back in Alabama. And those pictures you see to the right are beautiful. You know, it's a nice yellowish green color. A little simple, but that's not all the species can do. This red mark in the back of the throat is common for most of the varieties. And uh, there are quite a few named varieties for most of these pincher plants. This would be Var ornata. I believe the previous photo would have been Var rugelii. And so it's all within Saracenia flava. So you get this variety of color patterns and you can get onto rubra where things start getting more red and then all the way to heteropurpurea which is almost purple so let's just let's scroll through some of this really amazing combinations you might see if you were to go out to a pitcher plant bog in the wild so that would be that heteropurpurea all the way at the far end of the spectrum and these things are not small i mean that is as big as my hat I mean, this thing is, that picture was almost as big as my face. It's just amazingly large. And again, this is the other tall species, so these are standing up over three feet tall sometimes. Just absolutely jaw-droppingly beautiful. And it, you don't usually just go to a bog and see one type. You know, these things are usually growing together with a fair bit of diversity. And not just diversity within the uh, pitcher plants, but I can see a large flower of milkweed down there at the bottom right, and some sporanthes orchids on the left side of the screen there. But also this wide variety within just Saracenia flava. But when you have Saracenia flava growing with the white top pitcher plant, Leucophila, and then that's uh, the snake mouth orchid down there below them blooming quite well get hybrids, as I mentioned with the oaks. So Morse pitcher plant, Saracenia ex morii, is Saracenia leucophila, crossed with Saracenia flava. This happens naturally out in all those counties that you see highlighted in light green in the map. And again, the range of colors when you mix these species together is, I mean, there's a lot of nice things happening in Oregon where breeders are really doing amazing things, but to find this in the wild, I mean, it, will, it will knock your socks off. It will make you want to conserve every last acre of pitcher plant there are in the world. But that's just a couple species and what happens when they get mixed up. They can, the hybridization can include multiple species. You can have 
three and four species included in the natural hybrid setting. So the hooded pitcher plant has a hooded cap on it. You can see how it kind of closes over a lot tighter than the other Thursday species we've looked at. And it does not occur naturally in Alabama. It's one of, one of the few that does it. It is a fine, fine plant. And usually less than a foot tall, but those ones Debbie Fulpritz was taking a picture of are a Okie Fanoki variety that's extra tall. So now, Sterostinia oreophilus, the green pitcher plant. This is a federally endangered species. You can see below the range map there, the Philodia leaves that do not have pitchers. And so this plant produces trapping leaves and non-trapping leaves. And it grows pretty far north. So we get pictures of these Philodia in the snow, actually pretty cold hardy. But what you'll also see is a couple of spots all the way up in Tennessee there. So we don't have any other pitcher plants that have ever occurred in Tennessee. And unfortunately, these uh, green pitcher plants no longer occur in Tennessee. And all three of those spots in the middle, two in Tennessee and the one in Georgia, have been extirpated. So they no longer exist. Which reduces the range for the species to that population that straddles the Georgia-North Carolina border, which is a single population. And then the ones in northeast Alabama. So these, there are some critically endangered species of pitcher plants. We'll get into that a little more in the conservation section. But see that green pitcher plant isn't just green. It also, it also has some pretty exciting options. Now, again, there's some variety in the shape of these, like the hooded pitcher plant. This is a prostrate species that has a hood, like the hooded pitcher plant, but lays flat instead of standing up tall. Parapeak pitcher plant, the charming and very vigorous plant. It grows like a weed in a well set up log. And so I have, this is the species that I have the most seedlings of in a log. And then we have the uh, most cosmopolitan of all the pitcher plants, the purple pitcher plant. And so Saracenia purpurea runs all the way up into Canada along the east coast. And you can see that there is a disjunct red pocket down there in South Alabama and Florida in the Mississippi. And that is the Saracenia rosea, which has been considered a subspecies of purpurea and considered by others to be its own species. But the bottom left photo with those pink flower petals is the flower of Saracenia rosea where the other Saracenia purpurea species will have dark, dark brick red flower petals. So there's a wide variety within the species as well. You can see it going from that deep red to a more vague pattern. So, so much, so much exciting diversity to talk about. We just can't spend too much time on it. Unless my computer decides to let that lag. Hey, Patrick, you kind of. Yeah. Fade in and out a little bit there. Can you maybe put your boom a little? There you go. Yeah, great. Thank you. All right. All right. Sorry. Sorry. I was trailing off in volume as well. Um, so now the sweet pitcher plants are another scattered group, kind of like the purpurea. And within that, within that group, the uh, Alabama pitcher plant occurs. And so the Saracenia albumensis albumensis is very rare, but Saracenia alimentus wary eye down the coast is kind of common. But then uh, Saracenia jonesy eye is in the mountains of North Carolina around Asheville. And it's very common as well. But these sweet pitcher plants are more similar than uh, some of the other species, so I decided to lump them all on this page so we could roll on past them. You can see the difference here in the size of those Sweet pitcher plants, the albumensis wearii, blooming in the foreground with those short red flowers, compared to that Saracenia flava. The sweet pitcher plants in the Rupa complex are more around a foot tall. Sometimes the pitchers can get up to 18 inches or so, but you can see how much taller that Saracenia flava is coming up behind me in the Arboretum log. So, we did have some chat that time. Do you have any questions for me this time, Steve? 
Um, I don't see anything in the chat box. Just basically, you know, again, a reminder that if you're not on mute, please mute yourself. Um, any other, any questions about what we've seen so far, folks? Uh, he's showed us some really gorgeous plants. And that's fine. It doesn't hurt my feelings at all because that's just okay. telling them everything they need to know. Right, and well, uh, we, we do have quite a few other points to hit, so let's keep on rolling. Let's talk about cultivating these pitcher plants. We'll look at selections and hybrids and then how we're growing them at the Arboretum. Just to give you an idea of how eye-popping some of these wild selections are, here's whack em all which is from the Green Swamp in North Carolina. And most selections from the wild are going to have a story like this. You know, sometimes they're simple, sometimes they're complex. But you can see there that this one went from New Zealand to a man named Don Gray that eventually cultivated and registered it. And it's surprising how a lot of our native plants have moved around like that. The Sigios azaleas are another group where there's been more breeding done in England. In the U.S., perhaps. A hundred years ago, that was definitely true. But yeah, that variety of flavor, atropurpurian, is a real eye popper. And most of it is in color and leaf form, but there are some flower mutants like this tarnac, which is headless, doesn't have any reproductive parts, but everything just kind of clusters down to that center tip to give you almost a teeny form to the flower. Some very neat selections from the wild out there. But the uh, Theracinia breeders are a very vibrant community, very proud, very active. You can usually find a good display at most flower shows. Theracinia hybrids and species. For good reason. They're well worth displaying. And so, University of North Carolina came out with this bug series, which is a bunch of cute little hybrids. You know, the love bug and the dual bug. bug. We have them all in our body here, we have them there. Here I find your little plant. And so, let's, let's talk about building a bog real quick. You see here the first three bogs that uh, we built at the Arboretum shortly after they were installed. And this is a scale that I think all of you could connect with pretty easily. This is baby pools sunk down into the ground with some holes perforated about three inches above the bottom so it can retain some water but water also can move through that container and these things grew up and got big and beautiful and we were so happy with them we decided that, you know if we ever had the chance we, we might go a little bit bigger and so uh that, that opportunity did come at that georgia plant conservation alliance meeting when uh, ron dieterin from the botanical garden said you should We'll give you all the pitcher plants you need. You should just build a bigger bug. So a sunny spot is essential. So there's a good spot in the central arboretum there with some lawn that wasn't doing too much. So we got some supplies together. Got a thousand gallon rain barrel, 30 by 50 foot plastic liner, 20 yards of sand that went in a foot deep on the bottom of the liner. And we also put some underneath the liner to help fishing it. Uh, we used a dozen bales of milk peat moss with a two to one peat sand mix. And uh, then the water delivery system, which is just a soaker hose running through some drain tile. So let's let you see what that looks like. You get your water figured out. You get that thousand gallon tub in the corner there. And we put on a metal roof to help make sure our water was clean when it went to the gutters we installed to fill that cistern, which gravity feeds to the bog right out in front of that building. So this is that lawn we looked at from down slope. And you can see that it's been sculpted now. So we've got a couple low points that will hold water for those pitcher plants when we put a plastic liner on it. But the whole thing is on that 3% slope. So the water does all move downhill. And that's pretty typical for pitcher plant bonds, is to have water moving through them. They don't grow in stagnant water. And it's that motion of the water across the roots of the plant in the bog that is usually an important part in carrying away the nutrients that other plants would need. And so that slow subterranean movement of the water is really what you can see in a typical bog. You're not going to see a river flowing through it, but if you were to step into the bog, most of the year you would have a wet footprint that would hopefully be spongy enough to just bounce right back up and absorb that water. 
but it's going to be water moving through those bonds that helps carry the nutrients away and avoid the putrefaction and let the competition take hold. So, there I am commanding the troops. You spread that liner, guys. 30 by 50 feet pushed into three main pools, and you can kind of see the depressions for the upper pool and the lower pool towards the uh, house there, towards our shed there, and then a middle pool closer to the uh, camera shot. And the upper pool flows into the middle pool, and the middle pool then flows into the lower pool, and the outflow is right there where the three and four stand. Hey, hey, Patrick, can you yeah. go ahead and just mute anybody who's not muted, please? Let's see. We can try, because I'm hearing a little bit of crinkle, too. Yeah. Right. It's, um, it's, um, Maybe now we're good to roll. I think I, think I do not hear the breathing or crinkling now. So, a foot of sand in the bottom allows for that water flow. If this were solid with the pizza sand mix, then I think we would probably have a lot of water getting held in there and you kind of get that sour, stagnant peat water, you know, when peat just sits in wet. And so having a foot of sand at the bottom of this bog allows for that flow through the different parts of it. And you can find some pitcher plant bogs are going to be a, you know, almost completely sand substrate. And it's just a constant flow that keeps the plants happy. But since we don't have as much water as some natural hydrologies, the peat layer at the top of this is really what helps keep the moisture on the roots. So, there's good old Arboretum crew mixing wheelbarrow after wheelbarrow and sand and peat. You just throw the buckets in the top at that two to one rate, and it comes out the other end in the wheelbarrow, and we wheel it around, dump it on top of the bog. And here you can see us installing our water delivery system, and this is just a soaker hose inside of that drain tiles, what I call that perforated black pipe. And so, click back here, it's at the top of that slope. So that water should weep pretty evenly through that entire thing. Now, what we found is that in the summertime, when things start to get dry and there's not many other water sources, we do have some rodents that'll get in there and chew a little hole in the um, soaker hose to get a drink. But it's not the end of the world because the whole thing is on a plastic liner anyway. And so when we do lose water like that, it's going into the bog system. And so it's okay that it's a loose weeping system as long as we can distribute it throughout the whole thing. But at the end of that pipe that's closest to us, I would have the uh, end of the soaker hose that has a threaded cap on it. And so if I find that the bog's dry, then I just open the cap on that soaker hose and let water flow three, freely through it because the outflow is high enough that the entire pitcher plant bog can have pooled water sitting a couple inches deep in it. And when everything needs a good drink, that's what I like to, you know, dump a, several hundred gallons of water on it and just let them drink and they'll soak it up. So once we had all that stuff ready, it was time to go get some plants. So this is the pitcher plant bog at the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. Uh, they claim the world's largest carnivorous plant collection. And I believe it's true because there's a lot that you see at Atlanta Botanical Gardens and their display bog here. But then you go behind the scenes in a greenhouse like this, and then uh, at the final section, we're going to see their conservation gardens at Gainesville. But that is a, uh, a fine greenhouse to get to go shopping in. It was a a rare pleasure to have them donate so many plants to our pitcher plant bog. But going home with a cart like that is uh, hard to compare to. And so then we got to got to really stomp that bog in. So this was recommended by that Georgia Plant Conservation Alliance. Just dance that bog in. It's just some 
bluegrass pickers out there to stand around and let those kids jump up and down and churn that peat a little bit into the sand. And that was a good day. That was a good day. And all those kids, you know, they can come back and look at that bog later and say, hey, I did a little mud dance out there at an arboretum program one day. So that's, that's fun stuff. It gives, you know, a little bit of ownership to the people of the community that bog. And so here you can see we've got our pitcher plants plugged in, but also quite a lot of grasses incorporated in there. And the grasses grow a lot faster than the pitcher plants. So that layer jumped right up and started filling in. And now you can kind of see how on the bottom left is the lower, wetter end of the bog. And you can see the peat has washed down there and pooled and the sandy, drier side has settled up top. But that's what we wanted to happen because in these pitcher plant bogs, you get striations of species that occur on these different gradients where on the upper sandy side of a bog, you'll find those white top pitcher plants because they like it a little bit drier. And then slightly down slope, you'll find that ex morii, the hybrid between the white tops and the uh, Saracenia flava, the yellow trumpet. And then you get down to the wet spot and you find flavas down there. And so it's important to have a variety of options and now we've got seedlings coming up. The white top seedlings come up uphill in the bog. The flavor seedlings are coming up downhill in the bog. So we, we put a bunch of material in there, but they're figuring out exactly where they're gonna be. And so this is towards the end of our instruction over outdoor classroom. And now this thing is settled in and they do pretty well. Very exciting in the springtime. This is probably late April when the flowers are coming up. We usually do, we do burn the bog about two thirds of it every year. And so after a good burn, it'll, it'll bounce back strong early spring. But then it's nice in the summertime too. You got woody plants like that Zenobia coming in, which grows with Saracenia flavor in the Carolinas. And uh, that grass pink orchid, beautiful, beautiful thing. And it's things that you can get growing if you have pitcher plants happy. So all of that is scale. If you get sun and you get water, and get some sand in the bottom, then you can incorporate pitcher plants in container gardens, in the ground, or on the margins of water features, and don't have the time to dive into it today, but it's a great program for botanical gardens to uh, build some carnivorous planters. So before we get on to our last section, conservation of pitcher plants, do we have any questions from the group? Yeah, we had a couple come in. Um, First of all, uh, I think we had a couple of volunteers to come and stomp next time uh, that you build a new bog. And uh, we have a new one that's going to get built, actually. So that's exciting. All right. Exciting. My, my contact information will be at the end of the program. So okay. Write it down. Okay. So we had a couple of questions about, uh, first of all, when did, what time of year do these things bloom? Okay. So most of them are going to be late spring. But then we do have some that go more into early summer. But there, there's no fall bloomers. But the best peak bloom at the Arboretum is usually right at the beginning of May. Okay. So they'll actually bloom and then drop their petals. But then that facial staminal disc and the sepals often will carry that red or green or pink, purple color, whichever it had, on for months. And so in the summer, there's still a lot of what looks like, you know, healthy flowers standing, right. but actually they've dropped their petals and all the reproductive parts are done. And there's a seed pot forming behind that staminal disc that you don't see until fall when the disc kind of crumples and folds forward. Okay. And um, are there any particular types of insects that they prefer or is there, you know, Good question. Good question. Do you, do you cultivate any insects to feed them? <laughs> well, actually, our wildflower meadow surrounds the pitcher plant pond. So, yeah, we are kind of baiting in the food. But we don't feel too bad about that because <laughs> the uh, wildflower meadow is much bigger than the pitcher plant pond. But one of our frequent educational programs with the kids is we'll have a data sheet and we'll get some kids with hooded pitcher plants some kids with white top pitcher plants, some kids with the uh, yellow pitcher plants, and then they'll cut open the pitcher and try to identify as many insects as possible. 
and figure out which pitchers are eating what. Because the way that these plants can grow together without competing with each other is they have different prey items they specialize in. And so the winged pitcher plant is often full of ants. You have a lot of bumblebees and the larger ones like the white top and the flava. You have small sweat bees, but it's mostly nectar feeding plants or nectar feeding insects are what gets attracted to them. But then the prostrate pitcher plants like the parrot beak pitcher plant and the purple pitcher plant, those have a wing that actually intersects walking insects. So imagine that round rosette of leaves. If an insect walks into that trap, it'll hit that wing, walk along the leaf, and it either goes to the center and then redirects out and falls in a trap, or it turns to the outside and falls inside the trap. And so there are different pitcher plants preying on different things. It's a short answer at the end of that long. Okay. Um, and one of the thing, uh, we had a question about if there are regulations over collecting these in the wild. And in Alabama, we have two federally endangered species. And so those are pretty closely monitored. It is legal to move seeds that plants around inside the state. It's highly discouraged with those endangered species. You can't move them across state lines. Um, but with other things like the white top and the flavor, those produce tons of seeds. If you have landowner permissions, you can move them wherever you want. Um, the arboretum of the bog produces thousands and thousands of seeds that we give away all the time for people to grow up on their own. And seeds, they, they really do come up well from seed. We'll see some of that in the next section. Okay. I would imagine that, you know, state parks, you can't take things out of state parks. I'm not sure about national forests. Well, so the truth is that you can apply for permits to collect things in state parks. Okay. And if you're doing something like taking them to the Memphis Botanical Gardens for a, you know, intentional conservation collection, like I was talking about, where you're keeping good records, and that's the type of thing that, you know, might get approved. And that's what the permitting process is for. So people that know what the collection pressures are can decide when that's okay. appropriate. When it's done. All right. Not We're a flat gonna... no. Okay. We'll let you move on. And if you have any other questions, again, keep putting them in the chat box and we'll do this again in a few minutes. All right. Let's go. It's conserving pitcher plants, which is my favorite. It really, really gives me a warm, fuzzy feeling. Get out there and fire up a chainsaw and cut down trees and then pour liquid fire all over the ground and watch the place just go up in a blaze because the pitcher plants really do love it. And so we're going to talk about the uh, in situ conservation of pitcher plants, which means work in the situation where they naturally occur, and then ex situ conservation, which is conservation work in gardens mostly. And so the logo for the Alabama Plant Conservation Alliance is up there on the top right. And I'm the coordinator for the Alabama Plant Conservation Alliance. So I call all these state parks and places that are land trust, like the Nature Conservancy and Forever Wild that own the place where these plants grow and universities to make sure research isn't redundant and try to get good conservation of these plants. So I'll give you a quick glimpse the, the, the whys and hows and wheres. So as I said, caring for the plants where they occur, and pitcher plants have lost 98% of their habitat to development. And so when I have a group of third graders in there, I say, all right, now, what, imagine we lost 98% of you, and that usually leaves like, you know, one kid from the knees down. It's all that's left from the class of 30. And so we've lost most of the pitcher plants, where they live, their genetics, they're going through a big bottleneck. And so just to give you an idea of what we lost, just look at the, that 2% is left. It's so much amazing stuff. And this is a well fire maintained white top pitcher plant bog in Somerdale, Alabama. It's just a gorgeous wet meadow, like nothing else. And then back to this Blackwater River State Forest in Florida with those flavors. And that place, this was just last summer. I, I haven't gotten over it yet. I saw it for the first time. It's just can't stop loving it. So, but we're going to focus in on one species for this section. We're going to talk about the Alabama pitcher plant, the Alabama cambrake pitcher plant, the Alabama. So this is it in situ. And 
got a little time lapse there, a little time hop anyway. So you can see that tree is the same in the background. And in 2009, we planted out some baby pitcher plants there. They've been grown from seed from another place on the property. And then 2011, we're glad to say they had grown up well. And this is maintained by the Nature Conservancy. Uh, they, they're putting fire over and over on this landscape, keeping them happy. And those 10-year-old plants, I mean, they look pretty good. You can see one that's kind of remained in a cluster right by my arm there. And then that other one to the left has kind of expanded in a ring from the center where it's grown so fast the center has died out. And it's pretty pretty impressive to be able to see one baby do that in 10 years. So it's exciting to see this stuff work. Other spots aren't doing so good. You can see Ron on the left there in the uh, uppermost picture on the outside of the barbed wire fence where he spent years maintaining pitcher plants with fire, but then it got, the ball got dropped and then the only place they were left was inside that, the other side of the barbed wire fence because the uh, rose was so thick inside of the used to have fire that the pitcher plants got drowned out. So monitoring these populations is important just to know where the work needs to be done. And so this is the Atlanta Town Gardens project monitoring in transects there in the center picture and moving into a new bog on the right. They're really excited to do that work. Digital safety check. So we have to be real careful going to these sites that information doesn't get out because poaching is a real problem. And there's only about 11 sites that I curved that on that picture plant. And there's only four of those that are healthy enough to produce seeds. So if I'm going to take a group of volunteers like those students out with me, we actually took all of their cell phones, had them turn them off, put them in a bag, put them in a car at the location where we met, put them all in vans, drove them to the pitcher plant pond to do the work. And then when they got back, they, their phones were given back to them just to help keep the location secret. But you can see in the foreground some of those Alabama Cambrake pitcher plants in the situation where they occur naturally. And those students have been cutting and dragging brush all day, trying to get more sunlight to these things. Because with the lack of fire in the environment, woody encroachment is really a big problem for them. So this is putting the fire back on the land. That's an important step because cutting down that woody encroaching stuff over and over gets tiresome. But sorry for the blown out exposure on that bottom picture, but you can see the forked, uh, it's a Cirilla Tai Tai on the right there appears in both pictures, but in that center picture, or the upper picture, you can't even see that pine tree in the middle of it. And it's hard to tell, but there are actually pitcher plants all in that clearing. So we cleared all that pitcher plant space over the course of a couple days to get some light in there. But XC2 in the gardens, we can do a lot of work. And you can see that's just, you know, maybe a couple of seed pods spread out an open peat in that tray on the left. And then once they get going, we'll farm them out one at a time in the individual cells and let them grow up. But there's very, very few of these things left in the wild. So it makes a really big deal when you can go out and get a seed pod like that one in the bottom picture. Look at how many seeds there are there. I mean, that is hundreds and hundreds of little critically endangered plants there. And there's just only a few places that have, you know, that many pitcher plants. And so in this tray, there's only two places in the world. That's the best spot for the species and the Atlanta Botanical Gardens. And so when they came to us and said, you guys need to be doing some pitcher plant conservation, they followed that with, we have more Alabama pitcher plants than Alabama. And I didn't understand that right away. But then on seeing their safeguarding collections, I realized that you know, there are there are more Alabama pitcher plants in these raised beds than there are left in the wild. And so it's hard for those seedlings to take hold, especially with environmental pressures like, you know, so much shade and encroaching vegetation and eutrophication of these sites because the uh, water flow has been altered by, you know, planting timber around them, by mining for gravel and lack of fire. There's so many things affecting the wild situations. but here they can collect seeds, plant them out, and do a good job of 
keeping them from dying and keeping them from mixing up the genetics by doing things like cutting off the seed heads and uh, keeping them from mixing up their genetics. And so here's our little safeguarding beds of the Arboretum. We're proud of them. We're, we're starting to follow the example and care for these things in our home environment. And one exciting thing that I'm working on right now is managing that green pitcher plant, Saracenia oreophila, in C2. And this is part of the first ever round of Section 6 funded projects in the state of Alabama. And this is happening right now where we're getting funding through the Endangered Species Act to protect plants. And this is the first time it's ever happened in Alabama that animals get the lion's share of the funding. And most and the majority of the endangered species are plants. And so there's a lot of steps we're going through in Alabama to try to bring some balance to that. And so this Oreophila grant I've been working on has been really rewarding. You know, like I said, get in there and chop down trees, pour fire on the ground, and these sad pitcher plants just pop right up. Happier than I'd ever seen them. And happier than just about anywhere else you can find the species in the wild. So it's really rewarding work to see that stuff happen. So I really appreciate all of you uh, showing up tonight in the Zoom world. And I uh, encourage you, if you ever do make it to South Alabama, go to Perdido exit on Highway I-60 or Interstate I-65. It's about exit 42. And the Nature Conservancy Splinter Hill property has a parking lot, a trail, interpretive signs. And this is just right off the interstate, three miles off the interstate. You can go walk out and see white top pitcher plant in the largest carnivorous plant community left in the world right there in South Alabama. And so we hope to expand those management techniques to other pitcher plant bogs and encourage people to grow them in their home gardens and you know just understand how blessed we are in the Southeast to have such amazing plants that are worth taking care of. So last round of questions, yeah, anybody I got anything? The only other question that came in was whether the bogs make the mosquito problem worse or not. Um, I, they, uh, they do not because that water should not be, it should not be standing water except for a day or two after a rain. You shouldn't okay. see it's seven days usually is the turnaround from mosquito larvae to flying away. And so, for example, if you're designing a rain garden in the landscape, then it would be, you know, designed so that it drains in seven days. The pitcher plant box are pretty much the same way. You'd want that water level to be down okay. within a few days. So do you all have a native plant sale or do you sell you sell the, the seeds that you're collecting or anything? We do have a big native plant sale, but we are really heavy on the uh, native azaleas and the auburn azalea series that are plant sales. The okay. pitcher plants are just so slow. And yeah. Take when is your sale? We have an uh, on-the-ground sale in the spring where we'll have lots of stuff, and it's usually around April 20th. And then we have a mail-order plant sale where you can come put in an order, and we have several native nurseries that we pool their price list together. And uh, you put in an order in October and then pick it up to the beginning of November. Okay. So a spring and a fall sale is the, is the okay. quick answer. Well, speaking of sales, um, I'm going to ask Ann Valentine from Lichterman to talk to us a little bit about her pitcher plants and her sale that's coming up. Ann, are you uh, you ready for that? Ann, you're on mute. Let me. I need to unmute Ann. There we go. Yeah. I can do it. Yeah. Take. Take. Okay, I think she's okay up now. Here we go. <laughs> Anne? She's in motion. Yeah, we can't hear her though. We, we can't hear you, I'm sorry. Yeah, I really apologize. Okay. Well, how about if we send that information out via email later? That sounds great. I mean, okay. 
Okay. Yeah, she does have, she does have, um, she does propagate some uh, carnivorous plants at Lichterman and they will be having a plant sale on October, starting October 3rd. So we'll have some information about that to you all via email soon. Okay, any other final questions? Just a lot of thank you very much, Patrick. A lot of thanks. A lot of people thought that flowers are just, the, the pitcher plants themselves are absolutely beautiful. I mean, I consider the whole plant to be a flower because it's so colorful and gorgeous. Um, I always enjoy seeing the ones in, the, in my big backyard, the Botanic Garden. And uh, so, you know, um, I, I think you showed us that it would be possible to grow them in your own yard. I mean, making a bog not that hard, not a mosquito draw, might be a lot of fun. So, and they do great, even just in a shallow container. Right. Yeah. When you said a uh, children's pool with holes in the bottom, now I think a lot of people their their light bulbs went off, maybe. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, um, thank you very much, Patrick. And I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna go ahead and pause the recording, and then we will wrap this up. Thank you very much, sir. Okay, and I'll you. come see you as soon as I can.